We have entrepreneurs who have created companies millions in value to companies over a billion in value. Could there be a link between that wide diversity of size of company and risk? So what I've asked each of the speakers to do is, you know, talk about an experience in the marketplace about risk and um, uh, share that with us today. So I'm really excited. Well, let's do this first. I, what I'd like is uh, to do is go down in order of presentation. Uh, we'll start with Scott and then we'll go to Brian and then we'll go to Ed. But just, you know, Scott, if you would, can you give us a, a, a minute or two on, on your background and who you are? Sure, Ron. So um, I'm Scott Hoffbauer. Um, as Ron said, I am uh, founded a company, Broadsoft, which was based in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. Broadsoft was based, uh, focused really on providing VoIP solutions or telecom solutions for service providers. So companies like Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, and so forth. Um, Cisco Systems acquired Broadsoft in 2018. And um, I left Cisco in December and started an advisory firm. So I'm now helping uh, technology companies with product strategy and uh, go to market, business planning, that sort of thing. So my background is mostly in uh, technology, but um, you know, when you are the founder of a company, you're, you're good at a little bit of everything. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, that's uh, kind of where I'm helping a lot of entrepreneurs now kind of get, get their, their companies off the ground and kind of give them some uh, advice and guidance on, on where to take things. Oh, great. Thank, thanks, Scott. And by the way, the uh, redecoration to your library looks really nice. Yeah. Really nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Brian Vaughn, uh, Ship Shape IT. Brian, can you introduce yourself to the group? Certainly. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the introduction, Ron. Um, ShipShape IT is a uh, managed services provider in the IT space in the lower mid-market. Um, in the last few years, we've also played quite a bit in the managed security services space. Uh, we're primarily uh, going after the legal industry, government uh, contractors, federal contractors, the healthcare industry, and the nonprofit industry. It's not to say that we don't do professional services firms other than that, uh, but we found that much of our application level expertise is unique to those industries and we can be much more competitive uh, competing in that particular space. Uh, we're headquartered in Bethesda. It's where everyone used to report to a good uh, four or five months ago, and now we're distributed and dispersed like everybody else is. And we're going to chat about a little bit of that today and how that affects your workforce from an ops and a security perspective. I hope you find it interesting. All right, great. Thanks, Brian. Ed Finneran. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me, Ron. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I started Atlantec Online in 1995 as an internet service provider. Um, we've grown uh, into three specific areas since that time uh, of the early dial-up days. Uh, but we have fiber throughout the region. We connect over 200 major office buildings with uh, dark fiber. We also have access to fiber to an additional 20,000 buildings. Uh, we also provide a wide variety of telephone service, uh, and we have two data centers in Montgomery County that co clients put their servers in. So it's all telecommunications focused, wide variety of clients, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, great, thanks. Thanks, Ed. Scott, uh, I'm gonna let you just roll and, and, and tell us a little bit about what what you plan to talk about today and, and uh, just go ahead and start us off. Yep, sure, thanks Ryan. So yeah, what I was gonna cover is, is around data privacy. So if you're not familiar with uh, data privacy, it's really um, a legal framework uh, which states how you're allowed to use um, the data that you collect from your customers or for, from consumers. So there are a number of uh, laws that have been established uh, around the world um, with regards to data privacy. Um, probably Europe has led the charge with the general data protection regulation uh, 
Act, which is GDPR, if you're familiar with that. And then in the US, California has put together the California Consumer Privacy Act. And again, these are all about, you know, how do you protect the rights of consumers and give them control over the data that's being collected by enterprises. Now, you may think this doesn't really apply to you, but every business collects some sort of data. Um, certainly, you're going to collect data on your customers. So you're going to have to uh, deal with these regulations as they come about. If you keep track, uh, you know, you probably saw all the big technology companies go in front of Congress recently. Um, certainly, there were two things they were focused on. One was uh, antitrust, but the other was data privacy. And, you know, there's a lot of people who feel that this is kind of the beginning of the U.S. government putting together regulations around data privacy. Um, certainly, there's a lot of uh, negative sentiment toward a lot of the technology companies for all the data that they collect and the perception that that, uh, that leads to. So generally speaking, you know, when you think about data privacy, there's a couple of guidelines that you can follow. So probably the first and the most important is, you know, if you collect it, you protect it. So if you collect customer data, you have to protect it. Um, and then the second thing is really, if you're protecting uh, data, make sure you understand why you're protecting it. Um, if you don't need that, then don't collect it, don't store it, don't keep it. So only collect the data that you need. So if you're collecting information about your customers, um, you, you know, your natural tendency is to try to get as much information as you can about those customers. But if you don't need a piece of information, for example, you know, do you really need their birthday? Uh, if you don't need that, then don't collect it. Then I think it's really important for, for all companies, even if it's somewhat informal, to have a privacy policy. So make sure that you have the consent to, to get data from your customers. Um, make sure you have a retention policy. So if a customer uh, moves away from you, do you have a policy to kind of delete their data? And then also, you know, as these regulations come forth, uh, your customers and consumers will have the right to ask you to delete data. So you need to make sure you know where that data is at and that you can get rid of all of the data pertaining to that particular customer or person. And then certainly you need to make sure you educate your employees and you follow a process. Um, so it's pretty important that, you know, if, if one person in your, your company doesn't uh, follow the rules, then, then, then you, you know, you have a problem on your hand or a potential problem. So certainly, I think when you think about security, um, oftentimes privacy is, is kind of very much tied to that. So you want to make sure you don't underestimate the threat. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So oftentimes, common problems that you're going to see with data privacy is, uh, again, people collect too much uh, information, unnecessary stuff, and then they store it forever. They never get rid of it. So if you think about it, it would almost be like, you know, if, if you're storing files in a filing cabinet, would you really keep all that stuff forever? Uh, the answer is probably no. Sooner or later, you'll start getting rid of it. You know, in the digital world, you need to kind of think the same way. So have, you know, policies on when to get rid of that data. Another common problem is just people not uh, adequately securing that data. So, you know, you need to make sure that you have the security policies and that your data is protected. Uh, another problem is just knowing what data you have and what systems is stored in. Um, you know, all of us use lots of different systems these days. Uh, customer data could be spread across, you know, 10, 20, even 100 different systems that you have. And you need to make sure you know where that data is at, where it's stored, and that your policies kind of apply across all those different systems. And then you need to make sure that you're not sharing that data with third parties, or if you are, that they follow the same policies that, that you follow. So oftentimes, you may be working with uh, contractors or, or business partners that, that need access to that data, but you have to make sure that your policies and uh, go across to those third parties. And then again, if you're going to use the customer data for some 
business purpose, you need to make sure you have consent from your customers. Um, now, while this probably doesn't apply to, to a lot of us, you know, some of the big tech companies will take customer data and they'll use machine learning or, or artificial intelligence algorithms to try to predict uh, behavior. And some of the you know, regulations that are coming forth are going to allow consumers uh, to, to actually have to opt in for that. So I'm sure, you know, you guys have all been on Facebook and Facebook recommends friends or automatically tags you in a picture. You know, all of that is machine learning and AI. And, you know, Facebook does that really without your consent. So some of the regulations coming forth are going to be, hey, you've got to give consent before that happens. Now, this is great. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the best prevention is, is to put together, you know, protection and make sure nothing bad ever happens. But what if something bad does happen? So I'll tell you a story that, that happened to me um, at Broadsoft. So we, uh, one of the companies that we acquired was providing an application for a large cable uh, company so I'm sure you guys have all have a mobile app. You can use it to pay your cable bill and look at your account information and stuff like that. So we were providing that application for one of the large cable providers. And as such, we had a lot of account information. So we had, you know, the, the user's name and address. Uh, we had, you know, what plan they were on, um, what cable modem they were using, and you know, information such as that. Um, and we provided a, a cloud service. So, you know, inside of the cloud, we collected all of that data. So as it so happened, uh, we had a big uh, file server out on the internet. And one of our operations people uh, opened it up to allow the customer to kind of access the data so they could pull it down. So it was innocent enough, but um, they forgot to lock it back down. And uh, good thing, you know, the cloud provider that we were using ran an audit and they alerted us to the fact that uh, we had left uh, this, this file server unprotected. So it was very simple to fix. It took a few seconds, we locked it back down. And, you know, your, your first reaction is that, hey, problem solved, <laughs> let's move on. Well, as it turned out, we had a legal obligation to notify the cable provider they had a legal obligation to notify their customers. It turned out there were about 4 million customer account records on this file server. Uh, so potentially we had um, just disclosed 4 million uh, records out, you know, on the internet to, to anyone out there. So immediately after it happened, we had reporters calling us, um, asking us uh, why we uh, had insecure systems. We were not prepared for that. Um, we had our customers calling us, asking us uh, if this problem was going to happen to them, um, which again, we weren't really prepared for. Uh, we had the legal team from the service provider calling us, um, threatening legal action. Um, <laughs> so. I guess the, the moral of the story is that, you know, you oftentimes think of the technical side of, of what you have to do to solve a problem. But the reality was, is we had a legal issue. Uh, we had a PR issue. Um, we had a financial issue. We had an obligation to the customers. Uh, one of the things that happened with the cable provider is that they actually had to report back to the FCC. Um, that was about a six month process. Uh, they got sued by, a, um, by an advocacy group on privacy, uh, saying that they weren't properly protecting the rights of their customers. So it was all said and done. We estimated that this incident, which was arguably pretty innocent and uh, not very severe, cost us probably in the neighborhood of $10 million. So... Not that this is something that, that's gonna to happen to everyone, but I guess the, again, you know, one of the things I wanted to highlight is how severe something like this can be and how important it is to, to have the, the proper security in place. 
And again, when you think about what happened here, it, it had nothing to do with technology. It was a human error. Uh, it was an innocent mistake. Anyone could have done it, but it happened. And you know, you sometimes think about technology as how you solve security problems, but oftentimes it's just process and people that get in the way. So again, I think when you have a data breach, you know, you really got to think about, first of all, you got to fix the problem. Uh, second, you got to make sure it's not going to happen again. But then you have to really conduct, conduct a response to that problem. And when you talk about a response, you've got to make sure that your legal team is involved, you know, what obligations you have, what the contract you've signed with your customers. Um, you have to make sure that uh, the people involved have uh, acted in the right way and followed the guidelines of the company. They haven't done anything wrong. So oftentimes you have to get your HR team involved. Um, you potentially have to deal with uh, the press. So you've got to get your communications people involved and make sure that you have a proper public response to the incident. Um, in some cases, and this happened to us at Broadsoft, we had to deal with our investors. Um, they wanted to know what happened. This was definitely a black eye, so we had to deal with that. And then you have to also do data forensics. You have to kind of understand what happened and did anyone actually have access to that data? So there are companies out there that you can hire that do data forensics. Um, it's kind of like data CSI. They'll go and try to figure out who had access to the data. Is it on the dark web? And you know how many people actually uh, saw the data? Sometimes those activities can take months to figure out and uh, they cost quite a bit of money to, to, to execute on. So again, I think it's important that when you think about data breaches, you just be a bit proactive. Um, it's always good to have a plan to know what you would do if something like that happened and, and realize that it goes way, way beyond just the technology. Uh, you need a communications plan. Uh, you got to get your legal team involved. Uh, you have to anticipate what questions are going to be asked uh, by the public as well as your customers. You have to have proper notification. You need to notify your, your customers in a timely manner. Uh, determine your legal requirements. And even in some cases, you may have to notify law enforcement. Um, you know, while at Cisco, we had an incident where we had a rogue employee that uh, did something um, pretty bad to the, to the cloud services we were operating. We actually had to notify law enforcement and they got involved and, uh, you know, so you have to kind of consider those types of things. So I certainly don't mean this to scare you, <laughs> but I, I, I think the, the, the message here is, I, I think this is something that you need to be aware of. Uh, you need to put a little bit of thought into it. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission has a, a number of good guidelines on what to do with regards to data privacy, uh, some simple things that you can do to prepare yourself. Um, and again, the best thing to do is just try to protect yourself and make sure a breach doesn't happen. But they also provide some guidelines on what to do if a breach does happen. So hopefully this is good information for you guys. And again, just want to bring some awareness uh, around the problem. Super. I appreciate it, uh, Scott. What we'll do, and for the audience, I started writing down some questions to ask. We'll do a Q&A at the end when each of the uh, presenters uh, finishes, and uh, then we'll do the Q&A. So if you're, if you're there and you have some questions like I do, uh, write them down, and, and we'll get to them at the, uh, the end of all three presentations. Thank you, Scott. And we're going to bring up uh, Brian Vaughn now from ShipShape. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for that introduction, Ron. I'm always uh, very interested and intrigued when I see a, a story like Scott's. It's um, not often you get the inside perspective on what happens at a billion dollar company. Um, and I really appreciate the forthcoming nature of, of what Scott shared. It's been my experience that most executives don't. Uh, this becomes a pride of, uh, of ownership where people often don't disclose this kind of data. I think the other misnomer and difficulty that can come with uh, a story like this is, is the audience and the market at large uh, tends to believe that this is something unique to large companies that have critical IP and sensitive data that people are after. Uh, and it's been my experience that that's very much not the case. I'm going to go ahead and jump over 
um, to my presentation at this stage. And we'll run through a little bit of those details and uh, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. <clears throat> so one of the great, great misnomers about data security, can everybody see the uh, presentation there? We do. Okay, excellent. So all the names and logos that you see here, these are organizations that are probably, half of these are known to the people on the, uh, on the uh, call today. Uh, the thing that makes all of these uh, common and what they all have in uh, a, a similar crisis is they all had publicly disclosed data breaches um, that affected their business, their public uh, relations, and frankly, their bottom line. Um, again, same misnomer here. People will see companies like Equifax that have a 150 million record breach of people's personal credit histories, and they think that this is the problem that affects the world when it comes to cybersecurity. The truth and sad reality is that this really impacts businesses of all kinds, particularly in the small and mid-sized business space. On average, they see a $200,000 financial hit uh, whenever a company is successfully attacked. Uh, HIPAA compliance, everyone's heard the story about the city of Baltimore uh, facing a ransomware attack. Uh, without a pivot, they had to pay $6 million to recover from that. Uh, these are the kinds of things that destroy careers and in many ways destroy business. Um, a painful story from the field, uh, Inc. Uh, Inc. Magazine did a story last year uh, and uh, create, um, assembled a great deal of data and did some analyses on what exactly the statistics are on this. 43% of cyber attacks are aimed at small business, which was something that surprised me when I, when I learned that last year. 14% uh, are prepared to defend themselves of our small businesses uh, in the market. $200,000 per incident, repeating that item there for, for emphasis. 50% uh, of small businesses have suffered a breach within the last year. Um, that breach doesn't have to, have to necessarily um, be um, a uh, publicly disclosed crisis. It could be uh, one record, one employee, but get a feel for just how prevalent that is. 25% of Americans won't do business with a data breached company. Think about yourself and you think about the Yahoo hack uh, for email history, uh, the Equifax hack. How often do you want to go and repatronize those kinds of businesses? Uh, and I think that's a struggle that a lot of small business owners, the audience today is mostly companies under 15, 20 million dollars that are very integrated with their local economy. Uh, the management team and ownership is known to their clients very closely. You can imagine the impact on any business when they see this kind of crisis. And what we see, frankly, with small businesses is they don't get out ahead of this. This is something uh, from a um, you know, legal standpoint, they'll dedicate time, money, and effort, accounting, um, uh, their contract law, their employee documents. These are all things that I think business executives dedicate time, money, and effort to because they know it's critical to the success of their business. But for some reason, IT becomes a little bit of a redheaded stepchild. People see it as a cost center exclusively and not necessarily something that can be a critical advantage for security or making their product offering more competitive for their clients. So with all of that fear and uncertainty and doubt and the, and the horrors of what happens to small businesses, we wanted to take the step of bringing the organizations aware of a, of a law firm who's um, uh, been very successful in the, in the DC area. Um, Hulan, Berman, Fincy, and Levenstein uh, has offices in Greenbelt and Rockville, Maryland. Uh, they've been at the security game and well ahead of the curve uh, for a number of years. And we're gonna uh, chat with Alan very briefly. Uh, Hulan Berman uh, is focused on family law, personal injury, medical malpractice, and criminal defense work. Alan Levenstein is the managing partner of the firm. And he, more than anybody within the firm, spearheaded this effort uh, to uh, be more proactive about data protection before it was cool. And uh, he, we're going to ask him to share his input today. So, hi, Alan. Welcome to the team. And Thank thanks you, for joining us. Um, we came to ShipShape IT three years ago over concerns of what our responsibilities were to our clients, both from a fiduciary standpoint and a statutory standpoint. Um, we were also concerned about proper and careful business management. There were American Bar Association recommendations. And frankly, we were trying to obtain E&O and cybersecurity insurance. And in order to do so, the carriers required certain things be take, steps be taken prior to them issuing coverage. So we reached out to Brian and they 
at ShipShape encrypted all of our local desktops, our laptops, our jump drives and tablets. Now, if any of those are stolen or lost and any of our clients and firm data is technically at risk, we're protected. We also set up a secondary authentication and login system using our cell phones that makes it difficult, if not really impossible, for somebody outside our firm to access our email, even mm -hmm. if there's a stolen password. We also followed ShipShape's suggestion about having the mail system stamp every email that comes from the outside as external mess an external message. Mm -hmm. uh, it minimizes the chance of an outside email deceiving members of our staff and our attorneys. So there are some other items that are more technical and others related to disaster recovery planning that are a bit above my skills and technical knowledge, which Brian can speak to, but that was our experience. Excellent. Well, well thank you for that. That's, that's helpful for both me and the team. And I appreciate the, uh, the plug there. Um, a couple of things that Alan, uh, Alan touched on there. Uh, what, what I call event driven tactics for security. Um, these are baseline items that now in 2020, um, we require of all of our clients, having encrypted desktops, having uh, more than one piece of information needed to log in besides a username and a password. That's typically called multi-factor authentication or dual factor authentication. So the idea is that if someone steals your password, you have a way to protect against that. Um, these kinds of technologies are now, Alan was ahead of the curve uh, when implementing these in early 2018, and now they've become almost commonplace and required uh, by anybody that's really being proactive around security. Um, couple, couple items and takeaways, we're not gonna get into a great deal of technical work uh, and technical detail because it can uh, not necessarily be interesting for everybody, but if any of these items are of interest, I want you to feel free to uh, ping Dan Blatt or myself after the uh, call or an email, and we'll be glad to provide some detail. Our business drivers, business motivations for this, Alan's uh, issues around the bar and fiduciary responsibilities are very common for regulatory compliance needs, regardless of industry. Uh, HIPAA compliance, if you're a GovCon, you have 800-171 uh, NIST mandates. Uh, every industry has some level of compliance mandate or for their um, uh, governing organization, for lack of a better term, that they have to comply with certain protocols. Um, these also get things like timely updates to desktops, antivirus definitions. As our company president or CEO is fond of saying that no, no backup solution is 100% effective 100% of the time, so you need more than one. And that's one of the central elements of, di of disaster recovery planning. As you, as you work through um, the worst case scenarios, this really requires uh, more than one solution and a great deal of proactive effort. Um, accountability and exceptions, has anybody had that instance where virus definitions don't get updated on a desktop because you have a user that won't hit the button and then they become exploited? Centrally managed automated threat mitigation solutions allow third parties uh, to be able to discover that and proactively go to these clients if people aren't doing what they're supposed to. We see it often where a senior executive won't be saving the data to a place that it can get backed up. They'll be undisciplined about that. You often need to go out of your way to fix that. So other technical necessities, we won't spend any time on those of consequence. Uh, email continuity systems are critical nowadays. Any virus and any malware is, um, is almost a given. Uh, data backup and storage is something that requires stakeholder uh, time and input. When I say stakeholder, meaning your team, your executive team, figuring out where that data is and what you're going to do with it. Uh, enhance login security with multi-factor authentication and pr protecting advices for endpoint encryption and enabling remote monitoring and support. So when something does go down, you're not waiting until an end user is affected in order to affect that change. All of that was a problem before the COVID-19 paradigm shift, right? All of this became difficult and relatively expensive for small businesses. And now, since this COVID-19 paradigm shift, there's devices accessing your network that are often, people have heard the term BYOD, where company, companies now have their employees' home PCs and home iPads uh, that are storing data, uh, which can be a problem for an IP protection. Uh, and also, if you have a rogue employee, uh, as, as Scott mentioned, and you need to be able to um, delete the data on their systems, that can be an issue if these are personal systems that you don't have proper software on or proper governance over to go and delete data that's on there. Um, email attacks are the primary vector, which is going to get me to the final slide and what we're going to recommend you do. Uh, very consistent with Scott's point, which is around behavior management. 
the technology requirements uh, often people get too focused on, in my opinion, and managing staff behaviors, uh, training and documentation of those, and then a loopback mechanism becomes the critical function if you want to stop people from doing behaviors that put your organization at risk. Kind of case in point there, across all industries and sizes, the average fish prone percentage was 37.9%. So when testing and sending malicious links to end users, almost 40% of the time, the average user will click on that. So that's the big takeaway of what I have for you today is internet security awareness training. There's technology in place uh, that is automated and consistent and provides a loopback mechanism that formally tests end users on their internet behaviors. So if they are getting a malicious link and they click on it, that's reported and tallied. If they're reporting it as they've been trained to, then that is reported and tallied. And if they do nothing about it, that is also reported and tallied. Because we all know the reality with employees, you can give them training, but if you don't have a loopback mechanism that you're testing that training and you're doing some kind of enforcement to modify those behaviors, you're gonna get a situation when people click on, um, on malicious links. Similarly, uh, out of band verification process, what does that mean? What that means is nobody ever can send an email to request a check and then it gets done. Accounts payable staff have to have a formal loopback mechanism where a, a communication other than email is done to verify that email request. If you talk about anybody that has uh, experienced check fraud and had, um, had uh, financial loss or wire fraud due to their business, it's usually an email attack vector and it's usually the person receiving that email and taking action without verification. And then the last thing we have there, and I'm wrapping up, is documentation. Documentation is the catch-all once you put these behavior modification manners in place. You have to have it in your new higher orientation. Uh, you have to talk to people like Lane Hornfeck and Alan Levenstein about getting that updated in your employee manuals, your offer letters, um, any kind of compliance documentation that you might have. If these changes that you're enforcing aren't memorialized, and then they're also not retrained at some type of repetitive basis, you're not going to get the change in behaviors that you want. So that's the whole takeaway. Sorry to uh, uh, get a little bit technical on you there, but hope to, hopefully you found it helpful. All right. Thank you, Brian, very, very much. That was excellent. Uh, our final speaker is Ed Finran from Atlantic, if we can get Ed on. And Brian, if you would stop sharing. Indeed. Perfect. Ed. Good morning. Hold on, hold on one sec. We, we see it online now, so it looks good. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, something a little bit different than data security. We're talking about telephone security. You probably never had a talk about telephone security before. Um, wanted to share with you a little bit about Atlantic Online before we get into it. You know, we provide three main services, fiber, and we connect up to the internet connect multiple sites for your organization, and we can connect you directly into cloud if cloud is important to your business. We have all sorts of phone services, hosted voice. Big thing right now during the pandemic is Microsoft Teams calling. So if you're using Microsoft Teams, we can actually make your telephone service, your PBX, right inside of Microsoft Teams. We're also now a wireless carrier. Uh, we're also able to secure all your data in our two data centers here in Montgomery County, Maryland. So those are the things we do. Here are some of the customers that we provide these services to. Uh, they all don't have all of the services. Uh, they have, uh, you know, one, two, or all three. Um, but you probably recognize a few of these uh, logos around there that we're providing these services to. So security in the telephone network. Telephone security threats are, are changing all of the time. You know, it, it used to be simple things like, you know, how do we stop robocalling? Call spoofing, which is people pretending to be calling from a different phone number uh, than they're actually calling from. Um, a big one is social inf infiltration. And this follows up on what Scott and Brian were talking about. It's all about people. Um, so you get calls into your business, they're pretending to be something, uh, they're not really it. Sometimes they tie it in with phishing emails. And I'll give you an example from my own company. 
someone called our uh, customer service team pretending they were me. Uh, and they said, hey, I'm gonna send you an email. This is Ed Finneran. I need you to send me $25,000 to help me close a deal right now. I'm gonna email you uh, the account number I need to be sent to. And he really pretended it was me, was friendly with the staff. Um, we stopped that in its tracks, thank God. Um, but these things are happening all the time and you need to have your staff properly prepared to deal with things like that. And that ties in with Brian with regard to the AP stuff. You know, you've got to have these controls in place. One of the, the newer things that's happening, and you may have heard of denial of service attacks or distributed denial of service attacks, but now there's telephone denial of service attacks. Many of our businesses are very phone driven. If, you, if your business is about making and receiving telephone calls to your customers, you need to be prepared in the event that there's a telephone denial of service attack. And I'm gonna be telling you a story about a very large one that occurred here in the area. Um, but the, the real change in, in, in TDOS attacks happening is because of the internet based telephone systems that are out there. It's so easy to get a phone number from some of these uh, providers. They, you know, they don't know their customers and they just hand out phone numbers and telephone services very easily. You can get thousands of phone numbers on the internet within 15 minutes and start making automated phone calls. And these attacks can be both manual and automated. And when I say manual, you may have heard of some things where um, somebody's angry with a company or a person and they put their phone number up on, inter on the Twitter and that they make statements that drive some people crazy uh, and you tell them to go call these companies. You can get thousands of telephone calls to your business in a matter of minutes if this happens to you and you need to be prepared on how you're gonna deal with that. Um, just as bad are automated attacks. So one person can get thousands of phone numbers across the world and using call generators, software on a computer, cause phone numbers to flood your business. These things are happening regularly. So how do you deal with it? You know, well, the first thing you have to realize is that most carrier networks were never designed to block any phone calls. Carrier networks, are designed to make sure every call gets through. Uh, in fact, that's what the FCC mandated. They want all calls going through. Um, so it's uh, traditionally the carrier networks are not set up to stop any of these phone calls. In fact, a lot of them are financially rewarded to deliver the phone call, if you think about that. They want you to pay for these phone calls. Um, a lot of the large carriers are also very slow to respond. I don't know if any of you have called Comcast or Verizon, tried to get tech support on a serious issue. It can take a while uh, while your business is being flooded with phone calls. Um, so it was just last June, June 2019, that the FCC even allowed carriers to block robocalls. So that's, that's where we are with, with the ability to stop phone calls. And uh, most of the other calls that we get have to be delivered. So some of the tools that you can take advantage of uh, are whitelists and blacklists, where you can go into a filter from your carrier and set up, these are the calls that will definitely accept. And you list in the phone numbers. You can also put in blacklists where you specifically list uh, phone numbers that you do not want to allow to call your business. You can also add in filters from things, I don't know if you use at home, something called Nomo Robo. Um, this, these are, and that's just one of several national lists of known fraudulent callers and robo callers that can stop calls from automatically coming in. Another technology you may not be familiar with is CAPTCHA. So that if your phone number is rang, um, and this is to stop robo callers, it asks the caller to type in a, a two digit number that they tell them. So call in and says, oh, please type in 42. And then you type in 42, and then your call is then connected normally. So that's one way to go. And then on the higher end, you can put in systems that dynamically um, creates these blacklists based on artificial intelligence, machine learning. They look at the pattern of the inbound telephone calls. Um, 
they see frequently called numbers, things like that, and they build these lists dynamically. And you could either have the system drop the call or send it to a capture server for them to do the two digit entry uh, to continue with the call. So there's definitely methods out there to um, help protect your business from, from these attacks. So a little story that happened to a, um, a law enforcement organization here in the region uh, that we're the service provider for. Uh, and this happened in the summer of 2018. Um, so they had uh, someone that they arrested um, and, and charged with a crime. Um, and he was released on bond. And the defendant uh, was extremely angry at the, uh, local, the LEO, the local inf law enforcement organization, and had the technical knowledge to run an automated TDOS attack against the, the LEO. So for many hours of the day, no citizen could get through to, to the law enforcement for this organization. Um, this did not affect 911. That's on a separate number. These were like the, the non-emergency numbers. And it also stopped them from making outbound phone calls too. So if they're doing investigations, following up on crimes, uh, checking in with citizens, they couldn't make those calls. The head of the LEO was furious about this. And, and, and I'll tell you what, I deal with FBI law enforcement all the time. They are not the, the most technically savvy people no matter what you see on TV, it's, it's fake, okay? Um, the questions I get asked about the internet and telephone service, you know, I, I have to walk them through a lot of things on a regular basis. Um, but the, the head of the LEO wanted to have a press conference, uh, talk about all this, and we had to calm, calm this guy down uh, and not to, to tr make the matters worse. Um, and the, the, this defendant really complicated things. He was really technically savvy. Um, and he was coming in from different source phone numbers. So it's not like we could just block one particular phone number. Um, he really varied things uh, a lot. Uh, in this particular case, the FBI, um, multiple federal organizations and the local LEO all had people on standby. They were trying to locate this guy uh, one of the big fears, and you may have heard of this, was something called swatting, where um, someone puts out to, to law enforcement, sends an email or makes a call and says somebody's doing something, and then they set the sw send the SWAT team. They could say they have a hostage, a child, and then they go in, and SWAT thinks they're dealing with a, a very bad situation. And they actually hurt people. People have dialed from, died from swatting. So in this particular case, they were very cognizant of a swatting situation, and they didn't want to hurt an innocent citizen trying to catch this person. Um, so the, the options, getting back to what I earlier talked about, um, CAPTCHA and Blacklist, they were no help because of the many attack vectors, the many phone numbers this um, criminal was coming in from. So the only solution was to put in AI-generated Blacklists um, which, which unfortunately is a very expensive solution, um, but it was able to determine uh, very quickly uh, the different phone numbers and attack vectors this person was coming in from, and it actually resolved the problem very, very fast. Um, so I'm happy to say we were able to resolve the problem, um, but it was a very dangerous situation, um, but it, it all worked out safely. So. The key thing for businesses to be aware of are that these things can happen to anybody. You need to be prepared for it before this happens uh, and have a methodology and a carrier that you can trust uh, to, help, uh, to help you through these times.